So I'd like to thank you all for coming today and uh, welcome to our colloquium. Today we will hear a very exciting talk by uh, Laura Arachi from NASA Ames about the atmosphere of Mars. And Laura received her uh, undergraduate degree in chemistry from Colgate University in New York. And then she did a PhD in analytical and atmospheric chemistry from uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, she was a staff scientist at SRI International before she joined the NASA Ames Research Center in the uh, atmospheric science branch in 2000. And she's also served as the uh, special assistant to the Ames Center director from 2005 to 2006, which sounds like a very exciting job. It was actually really boring, but if he gets to be the, the NASA administrator, then I'm going to claim it was really cool. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd like to welcome Laura to the talk. I'd like to remind you all that these talks are taped. You can always get them on our website, on the Colloquium webpage. If you're not already a member of our uh, Colloquium email list that sends out announcements, you can go to our website at uh, www.seti.org and click on the picture of Frank Drake that says Scientific Lectures. That'll get you to the Colloquium page. And um, you can find out about upcoming talks there. Um, uh, we have a great bunch of talks set up for you guys this winter. Um, next week, for example, you can hear uh, Jeffrey Van Cleve talk about extrasolar planets and Kepler. So I'd like to turn the podium over to Laura. So remind me, am I turned on? I am, okay. So thank you, Cynthia, and thank you to Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for the invitation to come speak to you guys. Um, it's actually my first time in the building, so thank you for the excuse to get out of my little cubicle and come tell you about some really exciting results that we've been working on. Uh, I'll start off with a confession. I'm an Earth-bound thinker, so my usual frame of reference is this planet, particles in the atmosphere of Earth. So my units are probably occasionally going to be different. Um, I apologize. <laughs> and I also come from a chemistry training, which again leads me to often use strange units on some of my measurements. So I hope that I've converted them mostly to things that you'll recognize, but I am going to make you think in wave numbers and not microns, I'm sorry. So of course, I'm the pretty face and everyone else did all the work. Um, Tony Colapreet is the PI of the project. He's the one who said, hey, Earth girl, come look at Mars clouds. Um, and Bruce Phoebus has done the majority of the work that I'll show you today, but he is no longer allowed in the lab. All he's doing is writing. So if he starts asking obscure questions at the end of the talk, you'll know why. Uh, Brendan is taking over from Bruce and their thesis advisor is Brad Stone. And Alexandria was here for the summer through the NASA USRP program, and so I'll show you the data that she collected as well. To get you oriented, uh, I thought I would start by telling you where I'm headed. I'm going to tell you the experimental methods. And the primary goal today, though, is to show you uh, measurements of ice onset conditions on four different surrogate dust materials, three different surrogate dust materials and a blank. Um, we've stuck those numbers, and by we I mean Tony and Bob Haverly, um, have stuck those numbers into the Ames Mars GCM to take a look at how our observations would affect their microphysical model. Then I'm hoping to have time to tell you about some new data that we don't quite understand yet. That's always the fun part about talks, um, where we see water being taken up, especially by the clay, but by all of our materials before ice forms, and as always, conclusions and future work. So water ice clouds are observed on Mars. We had some on the front page. Um, before we started, and they're an important part of both the radiative balance and the hydrological cycle, and they probably form on suspended dust particles. So I want to take a tiny little aside for just a second and make sure we're all using the same words to mean the same things, because sometimes I find myself halfway through a talk realizing I'm talking to someone to whom these words mean different things. So let me tell you what I mean by nucleation. Sorry, no? Go back to that first yep. Oh, yes. Uh, d downstream, downwind of the large topographical features. You see these white smudges? Those are clouds, ice, water ice clouds. There are also other condensed phases of both water and CO2, but today just water ice. On the ground, right. <laughs> Those clouds seem to be connected with craters, is that right? Uh, uh, volcanoes. So uh, uh, probably areas of fast cooling where as the air lifts up and the air process expands, it'll cool and condense. Um, okay, 
So classical nucleation theory is the standard treatment for how you would talk about the formation of a new phase of material. So let's say you have supercooled water, which is only metastable. It's really not the favored uh, form of water if you're, say, below zero C on this planet. But if you were to start the crystalline ice phase, that actually takes a little bit of energy to start the new phase because you have to overcome the surface tension barrier that will form between the solid and the liquid, say. So nucleation is the phenomenon of starting the new thermodynamically stable phase. And germ is the word I'm going to use to talk about the tiny collection of molecules that have to get together to form the new phase. The easiest way to think about it would be in a completely pure system. Say you had a liquid water droplet that was supercooled. So on Earth, that would be below zero. If it didn't happen to freeze, it would be supercooled. And it could miraculously, by the miracle of statistics, eventually crystallize into an ice particle. That would be homogeneous nucleation. Only water is present, and the phase is changing from liquid to solid. You can also think about the same thing if you had water vapor that would miraculously, by the miracles of statistics, find themselves coming together and forming a crystalline particle of ice. That one is incredibly rare. That's uh, really hard to do, just statistically thinking you need to get about 10 or 20 molecules in the same place at the same time by random motion. So that one's actually not all of that common, which is why we think, particularly on Mars, but in general, uh, why heterogeneous nucleation is actually the way to go. And that's where you take a little dust particle. So in this case, it's a little black circle I've drawn here. And you take water vapor molecules and you stick them down onto some other piece of crud that's hanging around. <coughs> Heterogeneous means has another piece of crud hanging around. <laughs> uh, in, in this case, I've drawn three of them for you. One where uh, the very large water vapor molecules stick down directly from gas to the solid phase. Uh, and then two different ways where you could have a liquid drop that has a little piece of something solid in it that provides the site for the ice germ to form. So heterogeneous nucleation involves some other material in addition to the water that we actually care about. This is much easier because it gives a place for all of your molecules to come together. It really improves your statistical likelihood. Um, so we're going to talk about heterogeneous nucleation. And in particular, oops, where's my circle? There's my red circle. In particular, we're going to look at um, heterogeneous deposition of vapor onto solid. The only thing that I really want you to take away from this equation, which describes um, the surface tension barrier and then the energy gain for growing these germs, is this letter S up here. So in the numerator, there's a variable that is, in this case, defined to be the saturation ratio. It's essentially the relative humidity. So just keep in mind that it's in there, and we're going to come back to that later. What's the it's the Gibbs free energy for forming the germ of radius r, where the radius is across the x-axis. So once you are larger than, say, this red dashed line, it's energetically favorable. It's downhill, spontaneous to grow your germ. So if you can statistically, miraculously get, in this case, r number of germs together, you'll grow spontaneously. There's two terms in it. One is the penalty you pay for creating the surface tension. And then the, uh, the benefit you have for being in the thermodynamically stable phase, moving out of the metal stable into the stable phase. At very short times? Yeah, very short. This little bit? Yeah. I haven't a clue. <laughs> but I can find the equation, we can figure it out. But I don't honestly know off the top of my head. <laughs> so water ice clouds are observed on Mars. It's presumed that they're heterogeneous nucleation. And given where we are in the phase diagram with the pressures and temperatures of Mars, um, it's very likely to be vapor deposition onto a piece of dust. Some of, the GF, um, some of the Mars GCM models actually are addressing the microphysics of cloud formation and are modeling the physical properties of this process. Commonly, the models use a parameter that I'm just going to call M. If you care more about it, we can talk more about it, but I'm just going to call it M. They commonly use a value of 0.95, and that's taken from the, um, basically from the terrestrial literature. There's nothing better to choose for Mars yet, so this sort of standard number um, 
was used, and that in the models comes out to mean that ice starts at about 120 or 130 percent relative humidity. It's a reasonable guess, but I'm going to show you that it's wrong. Um, and fortunately, I guess, from my point of view, we do see some differences from this presumption, and it may turn out to be the explanation for why the models are currently suggesting wetter than the observations. Yes, atmosphere, currently, my understanding is that measurements, observations of the atmosphere show it drier than the models. So we're hoping that by offering some new parameters, the models will come into line. So, like I said, we took dust samples re representing several probable particle types, threw them in our vacuum chamber, added some liquid nitrogen, added some water vapor, and we used these conditions here, about 155 to 185 Kelvin. That's the one unit that you will see that is consistent. No, that's not true. Almost always, you're, you will see temperatures in Kelvin. Uh, pressures for us, we're used to thinking in Tor. So I've given you some millibar here to give you a fighting chance in case Tor isn't your unit of choice. Our water pressures were about 2 times 10 to the minus 7, all the way up to almost 1 times 10 to the minus 4 Tor. It's roughly equivalent to millibar. It's, it's a 3 quarters conversion factor. So if you can do millibar, it's about 3 times 10 to the minus 7 to about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4 millibar of water pressure. I can't do precipitable microns. For those of you who think in that unit, you're going to have to teach it to me because I don't understand it. So we do this in the lab. Like I said, we have a um, vacuum chamber shown here with a turbo pump, which I love my turbo pump. It's very well behaved, and it gets us down to super good pressures, like 10 to the minus 7 tor. We have ion gauges, valves, uh, gate valves to protect the turbo pump, all the things you'd expect for a vacuum chamber. And then we have an infrared spectrometer, which we use to diagnose the growth of ice. We pass the infrared beam through some salt windows in and then out again from the chamber down to a detector. And what's here in the beam path is our dust. So what you're looking at, that little gray rectangle, is the side view of a copper donut. That donut's screwed into a liquid nitrogen cold finger, and it also has some heaters wrapped around it. So between balancing the liquid nitrogen and the resistive heating, we can control our temperature uh, in the range that we just talked about, about 155 to 185 Kelvin. And then in that donut, we just set a silicon, a silicon wafer down in there. Silicon is transparent in the infrared, so we can actually see right through it. Then we sprinkle our dust on top of the silicon wafer, and we can see the dust in the infrared because it absorbs in certain regions. Uh, cool it down with liquid nitrogen, add in some water vapor through a valve up here, and we're good to go. So I'm just going to turn this sideways um, and show you what the mount looks like from the top sort of sideways. So here's our silicon wafer with our red dust particles on it and some very large water vapor molecules not drawn to scale. What we do, we pass the infrared beam down through our dust sample and as water vapor condenses on the dust, we see it in the spectrum. So we're only really looking at the condensed phase material with the infrared. Our beam path is pretty short. We don't really pick up the vapor very much except on the bad days when we had a leak. And I'm hoping I didn't show you any of the bad data. Does the silicon do any sort of um, nucleation when there's no dust? Right? You are a perfect segue. Give me three slides, and that was the first test. We need to, it does, so we need to characterize it. <laughs> is, excuse me, is the gas pure water vapor? Or is there In this case, uh, we add uh, purified water vapor, but we always have a little bit of residual air in the chamber. Um, the water vapor for our warmest experiments is about 100-fold higher than the residual air. But our coldest experiments, it, it's about uh, one-third or so air and about two-thirds of water. So at the lowest total pressures, we do have to account for the leftover air. Can you give us a better idea of the pressure? <laughs> and what that corresponds to in terms of altitudes on Earth and Mars? Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, more water than in the atmosphere of the moon, less water than the atmosphere of the earth, um, mesosphere, actually earth mesosphere I'm discovering, these are about the right conditions for, for the amount of water, not, yep. the, the amount, not your vacuum chamber. Right, yep. So 80 kilometers on earth, so it's pretty dang dry by earth standards, yeah. And when I say we did these experiments, it's Bruce and Alex. Um, but you guys know that, right? You're smarter than letting on for that. 
uh, what's that, two inches diameter, and they're two millimeters thick? Inch? Sorry, inch in diameter. See, Bruce did all the work. <laughs> Um, so the spectrometers here, the infrared beam comes down through this charmingly fashionable PVC tubing into the lovely black garbage bag, um, but that's to keep the room air out of the way. It interferes with the signal. Um, and then down inside the vacuum chamber, here's where that wafer is mounted. The detector is actually under the table. This is the funnel for adding the liquid nitrogen. And here's the water vapor delivery line. It's kind of hard to see. And of course, the water comes out of a glass bulb, so it doesn't photograph well at all. All right, so we put the dust on the silicon substrate, put it in the chamber, evacuate the chamber, add a flow of water vapor, and then step down the temperature. Once we've gotten the data that we want, we go back at the end and calibrate the thermocouple just to make sure we really understand what we're looking at. And then we calculate that relative humidity, that S crit value, the relative humidity at which we saw the ice form. And then we repeat it over and over and over again. Um, with different dust materials and at different water pressures. In case you've not seen it before, this is the infrared spectrum, the mid-infrared spectrum of water ice. This is the feature that we observe. It's huge and very sensitive for us, um, and it makes a great monitoring device. So what I've got here is frequency along the x-axis. This is 10 microns over here at 1,000 wave numbers, and this is about 3.2. This is the water, the OH stretch of water. Okay, so here's what data actually looks like. And when I tell you this is a typical, typical experiment, you'll understand that means this is the best we could get. <laughs> Everyone does this, right? You show your best data and call it typical. So what I'm showing you here in red is the temperature. So you can see that there are three temperature steps shown, two steps, three plateaus shown here. And that's on the right-hand axis. So this data plot starts at about 168 Kelvin, steps down, steps down again. The black dots are plotted on the left axis, and those are the integrated area of that pointy peak, that three micron water OH stretch feature that I just showed you. It's the integrated area of that peak as a function of time as the experiment progresses. So what you can see is that things are happy and stable up till about 110 minutes, and after this last drop in temperature, the peak area starts to grow dramatically. And that's our indicator of ice. So nothing, nothing, nothing. And what I'm not showing you is the water pressure. It made the plot really busy. The water pressure is constant through this whole time. Cool a step and wait. Cool a step and wait. Cool a step and ice starts to grow. And this peak area grows like a bat out of hell. What I've got sh to show you over here is the formula for this S crit, this critical saturation value that I'm going to be showing you throughout the rest of the talk. So the numerator of this ratio is just the observed pressure. We read it off the gauge. And the denominator is the equilibrium pressure at that same temperature. So really what this answer turns out to be when you're done is the relative humidity. But then move the decimal point two places. So if S is 1.0, it's a relative humidity of 100%. If S is 2.0, it's a relative humidity of 200%. And they're going to get worse from there. It's actually pretty cool. So in this particular experiment, at about 110 to 115 minutes, ice nucleated. So we read off the temperature. Keep track of that. It was about 167 Kelvin when that happened. The water pressure, which I'm not showing you, but we have the data. The water pressure was about 8 times 10 to the minus 6 torr. If you go to the literature and look up the denominator, you come out with a ratio of about 2.8. So it was 280% relative humidity by the time the ice finally got its act together and formed a germ and started to grow. To prove that we're honest about it, I'm also going to show you the end of this experiment. So here's what I just showed you, this early part. We grow a whole bunch of ice, and then we fuss around with the temperature until it's absolutely stable. That way we know where equilibrium is. We know we can calibrate our temperatures precisely to that point. That's all you need to know from this plot. We're honest. All right, so silicon, you were asking. First thing we did was characterize the empty system, basically. We put the silicon wafer in and did this experiment that I just showed you. In fact, the experiment I just showed you is, I think, this one. Um, so at each of these different dots, we did an experiment, cooling, 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 until the ice started. Once the ice starts, we calculate the relative humidity, plot it on the y-axis against the temperature at which we saw it. You can see that over these 12 data points, um, which happens to be about three orders of magnitude in water pressure, just for reference, over these 12 data points, 
which is about, what, 20 Kelvin there, we see a change of a factor of about 2. We go from about 1.5 to about 3.0 for the critical saturation for the nucleation of ice. And in fact, it's nowhere near 100% relative humidity. Let's see if I can get Oh, that's the data point from the last page. The bottom axis is actually the 100% relative humidity line, just to calibrate you. Um, so if you were thinking that ice should turn on at about 120% relative humidity or 130% relative humidity, um, and you had silicon wafers in the atmosphere of Mars, you would be wrong. You would be predicting down here, and we're actually finding numbers that are much larger. But that's just the silicon wafer. We need something more realistic. So we went out and acquired a sample. I called the company and acquired a sample of this standard material. It's a NIST standard. It's called Arizona Test Dust, and it comes with a whole spec sheet, and everybody uses it so everyone can use the same material. It's, um, it's a silicate. It's about 70 to 75% SiO2. It's got some iron uh, and some alumina, aluminum oxide. Um, the sample we had had a volume mean diameter near 5 microns, and we see that it behaves pretty darn similarly to the silicon. So this dashed line is the fit line to the silicon data from the previous page. And I'm going to keep doing that to you. The plot will be very busy by the time we're done. Um, so here's some error bars, again, to prove that we're not completely crazy. We realize that we have some imprecision in our measurements. Um, and for these 10 or so red data points, those were 10 different conditions under which we nucleated ice on Arizona test dust. And again, we're seeing it's harder to nucleate at the cold temperatures, and it's easier at the warm temperatures. Follow Yep, sorry. The uh, top short dashes that are darker are the silicon, and then the red long dashes is the fit to the Arizona test test. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get ugly. <laughs> sorry. How did you clean off the silicon wafer to do your original? Unbolt it, pull it out, uh, acetone, distilled water. There's dust in the air when you put it in. You know, it could have been nucleated. Oh. I hadn't thought about that, actually. We didn't control for that. Yeah, but we had a boatload more dust. Like, it was covered, sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. It was probably 30, 20, 30 milligrams. Um, so we know it wasn't that dirty for the blanks. And the each, um, so roughly speaking, each set of colors that I'm going to show you is probably on the order of two or three different in and clean it out and out cycles. Um, so hopefully that will get averaged out, but I don't think it's actually going to be dominant. So did you calibrate that? <coughs> sorry, the amount of dust you were in that sort of place during the way, so I mean, so I'm not clear at this point whether you just dump a whole lot on it, so that's got to be totally different than the... That was our goal. Right? Yep. Or do you just kind of go, well, a little bit, a little bit more, and then redo that experiment, and then see if there's any effect, or there's a critical point at which the location that was our goal. The second thing was our goal. What we wanted to do was see the effect of the surface area. So we started with the, what we thought was going to be the most obvious, you know, even Laura could do it, experiments. We'll dump a whole bunch on there, and it'll show this dramatic effect, and then we'll back off. We didn't see a dramatic effect, actually. Within, within the error bars, these are the same answers, either with, like, a teaspoon of dust or none at all, which was really quite surprising. We were going to do exactly what you suggested, and it didn't. The universe was not cooperating. So then we thought, OK, Arizona test dust, it is basically a silicon wafer ground up. right? It's just almost entirely SiO2. So we know that clays absorb water. We know that clays are a possibility in certain places on Mars. So we found ourselves a clay, and we figured if it's going to suck up water, it's going to be a great nucleator. We're going to get the most obvious data that anyone could ever want. Uh, so we found a sample where about 50% of the particles have itty bitty, itty bitty, bitty diameters. We're trying to get the surface area bumped up. Um, but what turns out to be the case is that the surface area was still dominated in this sample because it was so bimodal, was still dominated by the largest 5 to 10% of the particles. So again, we've got about 10 measurements. Here they're shown in green on this collected clay solution, and we see that they are a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier at a given temperature, say 165. You'd only need to get a saturation ratio of about, what, 1.8, 1.9? You wouldn't have to go all the way up to 2.3. Still not great. It's still not 100%. still not laying down on the bottom axis there, but it is a little bit better. 
So again, we're seeing the temperature dependence. We're seeing it's hard to nucleate down at about 155 or 160 Kelvin. But we are seeing some differences finally. We do think that this green line is most likely different from the red line at the warmer end. So then the question becomes, quite probably, any population of particles in the Earth's atmosphere, it's true. So certainly on Mars, it's true. It's going to have a variety of different minerals, different particle types, shapes, sizes. Treating this for real is actually going to be quite a mess. So we figured we would go, we would jump right in and we would go with a standard simulant material that's already quite a mess. Why not? We'll give it a try. So this is a volcanic, it's a, a weathered volcanic ash. Um, again, it's another one of these standard materials. You can buy a bucket of it and then everyone uses the same material. This one happens to be uh, from the less than one millimeter size fraction, although we did grind it a little bit um, as we were handling it. Um, we would suspend it in water, and you can see actually if we weren't quick about it, it would start to settle. So there's a big distribution of sizes in here. But we would stir it up real good, put it on the wafer, and we figured if everyone says this is the best surrogate for Mars dust, we'll go ahead and test it. So we did that, we got the orange data. <laughs> these plots are going to keep getting worse. So these orange triangles show you all the different conditions for which Alex and Bruce found nucleation of ice on the Mars simulant material. It falls nicely between the green and the red, and of course the error bars split the difference. So now I don't even know if the green and the red are different. But it actually is one of our better data sets in terms of linearity. So we're seeing the same behavior. We thought, okay, we know there's a big size distribution in this particular sample. You can watch it fall apart if you leave it sitting in water. So we figured, what the heck, let's go ahead and separate it. We thought that for sure uh, until we added that data point. <laughs> we also have a third, is it this one? There, our uncertainties are real bad on the cold end because the water pressures are so small and the air, the background air becomes a big uncertainty for us, which is why you'll notice the air bars on the left edge are much bigger. So I'm uncomfortable fitting um, a steeply rising curve through our worst uncertainty region. But I could see, and in fact, the, the clay data looked like that too. And we had originally started out fitting it that way. And once we got a look at the error bars, it just wasn't comfortable. Oh yeah. So Alex took a sample, shook it up real good. Actually, she even found a centrifuge uh, and took a top light floating fraction and a dark, heavy settling to the bottom fraction. Here are some micrographs to show you how they look a little bit different. They're hard to see, um, even up close. They're, it's hard to understand really what's going on in some of these pictures. The bottom is the easy one. The dark fraction, it looks like sand. It's big, chunky, lumpy stuff. Uh, the scale bar here, the red dashes are a millimeter, just to give you some perspective. The top, well, maybe the next easiest one is the whole sample on the left. You probably can't see, but I can tell you because I'm standing up here that there are some dark pebbles in here that are pretty much this subset that are collected in, the captured in this image. So these dark ones are found in here. And so are these itty bitty, tiny, fluffy, little itty bitty particles that clump together in these big regions. So here you can see a big clumpy zone. Here's another big clump. And those clumps are replicated in, in um, just by using the light fraction that floats at the top. This is future work. You'll see this topic come back. <laughs> Um, but if you take the big, chunky rocks that settle to the bottom and you put them back in the chamber, you do the experiment all over again, you get the same answer. So that's really quite reassuring. These olive, khaki-colored circles look pretty much to my eye to be joining the population of orange triangles. Okay, good, no surprises. Congratulations, summer student, your project worked. Until she did the next ones, which was she took the floating top light tiny material and those are these pink data points down here at the bottom. At the warmer temperatures, they look like they're in the same population. But we're pretty sure that these are different answers. We've repeated them. We've checked the error propagation. We're pretty sure that these are different answers. And we don't understand why, which is what makes this a really cool project. Um, we suspect it's a size phenomenon. But it's the opposite of the size phenomenon we were expecting. So give me six months, and we'll have another answer for you. Water pressure. The pressures are really low down here, and it makes the uncertainties huge, and it makes the 
Um, experimenters frustrated. <laughs> would have thought that increasing the amount, the relative amount of surface area would have helped. Wait, it does. Why did I? That must be my Australian brain. I must have everything backwards. Can I make Adrian Brown jokes since he's not here? That's OK, right? Uh, I forget. Maybe this should have been what we expected. I'll get back to you, Jack. <laughs> but it does look like it's easier on this light fraction of the simulant material. It does look like it's easier at the colder temperatures. I mean, it's still not 100% relative humidity, but it does look easier. I'm not quite clear. When you say light fraction, do you mean it's lighter colored or it's got a lower density? Yes. It happens to be both. <laughs> it was separated by centrifuge, so technically it is the lighter density, but it does. Small. Well, at least smaller. It might not be a, yeah, it might not so much be a density as a drag. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, in this case, it happens to be both for this particular material. The other thing we don't understand is why, I mean, there was, there was a large percentage of pink fraction in the orange fraction. The orange is the whole thing just scooped out of the bottle. So we don't understand how it got better when it was separated from its cousins. So that's something that Brendan actually is going to be looking at for us. Right. What are you normalizing? You're normalizing the same mass of stuff you put on? No, in fact, we don't have that data. We don't know how much mass we put on. And I would like to be able to do that, but we do not know that. We can tell you it's about the same number of dropper fulls, because we deliver them in water. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But this is just. Right, so each one is, each material is slightly different. But we are normalized to the same geometric area. We have the same beam path, the same observing path each time. So presuming that once a nucleus forms, the growth is fast, which we've tested and it's true. Um, all we're waiting for is the statistics of the germ to form. And it would be lovely to normalize that by surface area, but these materials aren't well enough characterized to do that. If they have the same mineralogical properties such that their absorption of the infrared light would be the same. Yeah. yeah. So all that data reduces down to this plot here. So the top line is the silicon, the red long dashes was the Arizona test dust. The big orange line here is the JSC Mars 1 simulant. The pink one is the one we don't understand yet, why it's different. This purple one I've shown you at the bottom is what's in the models. <laughs> so even if I can't tell you that orange is different from red, I can tell you that orange and red are both different from this purple one down at the bottom. So what I want to show you next is what happens when you put these sorts of values. In fact, we used the Arizona test dust because we felt most comfortable about those at the time. If you take these red dashed values and you stuff them into the Ames Mars GCM, what happens? Now I'm really out on a limb, because I didn't run these calculations. I'm going to defer all questions to someone who knows better. Um, but I will try to walk you through what uh, Tony Colpreet and Bob Haberly found when they did these calculations. OK, so the next three slides I'm going to show you are all difference plots. So they ran the model twice. They ran it first with the standard 0.95. This is the way it's done sort of approach. And then they ran it a second time using the lab results. And what I'm showing you is the difference between the two, standard minus the new parameterization. In this particular plot, what we've got is changes to the cloud particle radius that are predicted. This is a latitude on the y, time on the x plot. And if I've counted right, this is, two, no, this is three full years. So L sub s is running across the bottom, um, which is correlated with season in a way that I once learned and no longer really remember well. But my recollection is that about 
uh, 90, L sub s of 90, so about here, and then again about here. That's the summer solstice? In the north. In the north. Right. right. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you'll see that a, a lot of the areas where we see changes, so green is not terribly significant. Um, in case you can't read it, that's sort of where zero is centered. It's in the middle of the teals and the greens. The darker, the blue and purple, the darker regions are uh, in the negative part of the scale, so those particles are larger with the new formulation. In the reds and yellows and oranges, those values are positive, so what that means is that the standard was larger and the smaller new number was subtracted away. So in the red places, the model's now predicting smaller particles with the new formulation. So you'll see regions of both, blues and reds, and you'll see that there's usually the red is centered again around this L sub, L sub S 90 to 100. Um, and it seems to be more so in the mid latitudes, but also in the northern high latitudes. So the particle sizes in the clouds are changing in both directions. This is where it starts to confuse the heck out of me, because I'm used to thinking of one vapor pressure and one temperature in my little chamber, and this is the whole globe for three years. Well, what else can we look at? We also would want to know about the water vapor column. Does the atmosphere get wetter or drier? Well, in general, as the red areas show you, the lab parameters are giving us a drier atmosphere. So again, of course, it's temporally dependent, it's latitudinally dependent, and positive red values are showing you that the standard value was higher, and when they put the lab-derived parameters into the model, they got a drier atmosphere. And of course, these are all preliminary. We've only put in the Arizona test dust model uh, parameters yet. We certainly want to do the clay, and then I really want to see what happens when you mix the clay together with, say, the, the simulant material. And this is one of my favorites. It shows that the surface frost changes. It changes in location, and it changes in thickness. So if you look, again, this is north to south on the y-axis, time across the bottom. If you look particularly in the south, you'll see that there are these regions of red, which indicates that the cap is shrunk back when you use the lab parameters. So again, it's standard minus new, and that's a positive number. So these are areas that don't have frost on them when you use the new parameterization. What winds up happening then, of course, is you wind up with a little more frost behind you. It gets a little bit thicker, closer to the pole. And so this is a really neat feedback from my point of view because it also s begs a lot of questions about um, dust scavenging and how does any dust particle that gets deposited change the albedo of the ice, which then will change the radiative balance locally. So this is going to turn out to be a really interesting result. We don't understand it yet and we're not done, but it's really quite tantalizing. So in general, when we use the temperature-dependent lab results in the model, we see that there are significant differences, differences to cloud particle, cloud particle size and mass, and we see that in general, for latitudes below about 60 degrees, that the cloud particles are larger. Larger particles lead to a drying out of the interhemispherical circulation, um, and in general, there's an overall drying of the atmosphere by about 20 to 50 percent when you use the lab-based parameters in the model. You know, I don't have the strength for this plot. <laughs> this plot gets us every time. Every time we look at this, we realize we've defined the axes backwards. Um, what it's supposed to be, and I can't even promise that we've got it right yet, but I'm going to try. What it's supposed to be showing you, here's, uh, here's zero or no change. And again, this is a standard model compared to a constrained model. And this is the line of no change. Black is the water vapor in the atmosphere. and this bluish purple is the vapor, the water mass in the clouds. You'll notice that almost all the excursions go negative, and that's because things are drying with the new parameters. So again, it's time across, here's L sub s, it's time across the x, and amount of change on the y. But you see that they're tracking together, the vapor and the clouds, and they're always negative pointing. I was once giving this at I forget where, and realized as I was describing that the axes were upside down. <laughs> so I'm going to take just a couple of minutes at the end and show you the new cool stuff that we're finding. Um, I've been talking all about ice so far, frozen water on dusts. But I told you earlier that we liked the clay because it takes water up into its structure, and it does that warmer than the ice point. Jack? I'm perplexed. 
amount of bytes? In this case, it's normalized to the standard run. The standard run, but what's the basis? It's the presumption that ice begins at 120 to 130% relative humidity, that it turns on the trying, new phase. But you're trying to fit to the amount of clouds observed? No, 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 this is just model to model comparison. Clouds in the model to clouds in the tweaked model. Okay. And in this case, it's a ratio, but all the other ones I was showing you were differences. Yes. Okay. Yep. Water vapor, I presume, is a, con is a mass conserved quantity as well. Right, you can change its phase, but I'm presuming that there's a fixed amount of water in the model. So that it's also a, a fixed it's quantity. But it's allowed to move based on its vapor pressure and based on temperatures in the atmosphere. I would love it if there were some really good observations of water pressure and, wa and temperature in the same place, preferably with a cloud. cloud yeah, the, the frost location will be an interesting one to look at, actually, to see if, the, if there's enough difference spatially that that can actually be resolved. That'd be really good. So, until what, about a year ago, it, the models worked great until the observations moved? <laughs> and the models had all been tuned to the last round of observations, mm -hmm. is the way I understand it. But, you know, I'm allowed to make snarky comments like that because I don't work with the models. But yeah, my understanding is that the models were um, iterated towards a good solution where good was defined by a round of measurements that are now somewhat suspect. <laughs> so if you thought it was good before, <laughs> yeah. Some parameters changed and the rest of it with an unknown amount of error. Exactly, and probably an unknown amount of errors of unknown sign. Okay. <laughs> and probably opposite signs, right? But this one's a really neat observation, and uh, I hope to be able to quantify this a little better for you next time um, that we talk. Because what we're seeing, remember this pointy feature, so again, this is an infrared spectrum, sorry. This is frequency and absorption in the y direction. This pointy red spectrum here is crystalline ice. It's lovely, beautiful, happy crystalline water ice. This round, lumpy gray one on the bottom sure looks like, pretty much like liquid water. And the way I see it, and you ho hopefully you can see the same, the red, pointy crystalline one kind of grows out or happens afterwards or happens somewhere in the beam path. So we've already got some of this liquid-like water available probably in the interstitial layers of the clay. And we see, if we just monitor that region during the times when we don't have ice, so we're too warm to have ice, we still see that this peak area, right, so we're integrating, integrating this region anyway, even though it's not pointy. What are the different colors? Time, sorry, time progressing from gray up to red. Uh, we integrate this area here, and I'm only going to show you before the ice is Obvious. It's actually a different experiment. We went to a region of conditions where we knew we would not get ice. And you see that that peak area, as it's exposed, as we open the water here at about, I don't know, 30 minutes, that peak area grows and it starts to level off, but it's not actually done. But it had been 200 minutes, so Bruce dropped the pressure. He dropped it quite a bit, almost three orders of magnitude. And just a little bit of water came off. It didn't drop back down to where it had been. Just a little bit came off, but it kept coming off slowly for about another 200 minutes more. At this point, it's time to run for the bus, or Caltrain, I guess, in Bruce's case, and get home. Um, so we don't know what happens if we were to have waited days and days and days. And we're trying to design an experiment that actually can run unattended so that we can do that experiment. But we see this fast uptake, but never reaches equilibrium. And then we see that we only get this little bit back off. So we're thinking that this may actually, oh, sorry. I get clever every once in a while with PowerPoint. 
<laughs> we're thinking that this may actually be uh, a plausible reservoir for, and here's where I really wish we had mass calibrations, for some amount of water <laughs> in the Martian atmosphere, and certainly it's been addressed before for the regolith. Um, and of course, we want to do the same thing on the simulant material. And we see, this, we see the same behavior, this fast uptake of water. And by fast, I mean 100 minutes. And then a little bit comes back off, but really not very much. So it's storing some water, which is really a neat idea to think about. And that's one more thing that we're hoping to pursue in our future work. So I hope I've told you today that Martian clouds don't turn on at 100% relative humidity. The presumption has always been about 120 or about 130 based on some terrestrial measurements, but we're finding 200, 300% relative humidity at the really cold temperatures seems to be required. And it seems to be more about the water and the surface tension than it does about the dust. We tried several different materials and we saw similar behavior on all of them. Although uh, the clay is best unless you take the light fraction off the top of the JSC simulant, in which case that's definitely uh, the best nucleus that we're finding but we don't understand why it's so much better than the whole sample put together. Clearly, the models are needed to evaluate the implications of these findings. Um, there are several different feedback processes going on, um, all kinds of transport mechanisms, and that's going to take some serious uh, pulling apart to figure out what processes are really driving the transport of water, the changes in the transport of water. And last, I showed you just quickly that clay and the JSC-1 Mars simulant both uptake and then retain some water. Future work, of course, figure out what's different about the light and the dark fractions. Is it just size? Because that we can measure. We can get some standard materials that are well characterized, and we're going to go into the lab, and we're going to try them all as a function of size. Hopefully, that will work. But if it doesn't, the next thing that we're suspicious of, actually, is particle shape. Are the little ones more spherical? Are they less spherical? Are they mo more pointy and craggy? And do they offer more little nucleation sites? Once we get all the nucleation stuff figured out, we want to look at the growth rate, actually, and get an understanding of how fast these particles will grow and um, if there's an influence of the CO2 bath gas. So everything I showed you is just water vapor and a little bit of residual air that our pump doesn't get. But really, on Mars, there's a fair bit of CO2 available. So we want to try that, make sure that there isn't a difference. Mathematically, we think there isn't, but we just want to try it and make sure. And of course, we need to investigate the role of Australians in US politics. I want to thank Adrian for inviting me and Cynthia for doing all the work of having me today. And lots of folks need to be acknowledged. Obviously, my co-authors who did the majority of the work for this project, but also NASA Planetary Atmospheres and the Undergraduate Student Research Program for funding. I didn't design the chamber. I didn't assemble it. Lots of folks helped me figure out what was going, helped us make things happen and helped us figure out what was going on. And all sorts of people really make it happen. So thank you for your attention today. And if you see any of these people, thank them for me as well. You talked about cloud particle size. Uh, how does that connect to your experiments? It's not clear to me. Uh, you know, you have particles lofted in the air. They're free to move around. Your experiment is not quite like that. Can you say a little bit more? About right. That? So there were about three equations that I decided I just wasn't going to go through. So that's why it wasn't obvious. Um, what we measure is the critical saturation ratio for ice to form. And if you take that and you decompose it through the terms, the energetic terms in that the curve that I showed you that had the maximum, you take that and you go a couple more equations down, you get to this M parameter, which is thought to be the contact, the cosine of the contact angle between the germ and the dust. That's a transferable parameter. So we take our data, we reduce it down to this contact angle, and then we give the contact angle to the model, which builds it back up depending on the size of the dust particle. Oh, so Tony must set a dust particle size distribution in the model. And it takes the M parameter, calculates the angle, propagates forward again. So that's the piece that I left out. How do you m monitor how much water you're depositing? Do you measure the actual thickness of your ice? Or is this like uh, you're measuring the, the change in pressure, so like molecules, number of molecules? We actually have 
do not need to quantify the water that is lost from the gas phase because we keep adding water so that that stays constant. So all we measure is the ratio, is the total pressure that is um, basically applied to the system. What we would love to be able to do, though, is to calculate our ice mass, and so we're working on that actually right now using the spectroscopic parameters. Here on Earth, the process of uh, ice formation is not very well understood <coughs> uh, experimentally. And this was found by um, some student in Africa, I think, at the behest of a science teacher. They put some uh, warm water in the freezer, compared it with putting cold water in the freezer, and the warm water froze uh, earlier. The obvious effects, you know, evaporation and, you know, uh, nucleation and all this stuff did not account for the differences. Well, I would argue that that experiment in particular is not well enough constrained to give you all the parameters you need because you need an cl energetically closed system. But what you've said is true that even on Earth, the formation of ice, particularly in cirrus clouds, is very poorly understood. In fact, everyone thought they understood it until they realized that the field measurements weren't wrong. See, you know, the theoretical chemists and the meteorologists, they all blame the instrumentalists. I take it kind of personally. But they always were saying, oh, well, we know the vapor pressure of ice, so this water measurement in this, water vapor measurement in the cloud must be wrong. Well, they now have four different people measuring it, and it's not wrong. And they're finding very high relative humidities inside clouds. So you've got a cirrus cloud on Earth, and it's got a relative humidity of like 140% inside the cloud. You would never expect that because you would think that all that water vapor should just stick down. You should just grow the particles. They're finding that that's not the case. And so it's clearly far from understood on Earth. It's definitely true. Thank you very much. <laughs>